So I, I was like secretly laughing because I made your, your, um, your talk just a little bit shorter so we would have time <laughs> for some questions. And I could tell the two of you were like, what? I, I, I thought I had like a one. <laughs> because I think, I think this, is, uh, this will be a very important aspect. Get up there with Russ. <laughs> now, wait, wait. <laughs> um, I love this type of uh, discussion that we can have. And it, I, I think one of the aims of Flux is to come together and for us to be more and more in the same page. And sorry about my voice. Go Pirates, you know, that, that kind of killed me. So maybe I'll start the ball rolling, but I, I do want to see people like lining up. Don't be shy. Be provocative. You know, if you things that you disagree with them, please bring them, bring them to the fourth. I have a list of little things that I can start with. One of them, Russ, I don't know if you're aware of the fact that uh, reaction time decreases with age. It's one of the most robust findings. No matter what task you use, you will find decreases in reaction time. So I mean, I can understand reaction time variability, because then you're talking about individual differences. But what can you tell us about the fact that you're telling us, OK, don't look at developmental findings? Sorry. Um, I think that the point is that you, you, know, you need to be able to pull apart effects that are driven by reaction time from effects that, that aren't, right? Because we know that simply doing exactly the same thing for a little bit longer will cause you to have more activation, at least in some parts of the brain. That's interesting, I, I hadn't seen the CARP data. They, the CARP data actually argue even more strongly for that second way of RT modeling that I was showing, because if you do the grin band thing on kids and adults, that suggests you're gonna screw things up even worse. Um, so the, the, point, the, the point is just that you really want to know, are we seeing different stuff going on, or are we seeing the same stuff go on for a different amount of time? Modeling RT lets you get at that. OK, all right, good. Th there's one down. Yeah, please, go ahead. Um, sort of so following up on that, I mean, for, a, for certain kinds of cognitive tasks, it's very easy to imagine a reaction time capturing an information processing epoch. But for affective or social or decision-making tasks that have more complex elements to them, where the information processing might not be so characterizable through a behavior, what would you prescribe for those kinds of tasks? Or do you think that they don't have much utility? Let's hope that's not the answer. But <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think that you know, if you want to study that kind of stuff, that's the only way you can do it, right? Um, and if you're talking about things right that, that span across much longer periods of time, it's really challenging to know how to model this stuff. Um, so if there's some kind of parametric you know, variability that you can get, some parametric modulator to actually you know, push things around in terms of the, the amount of time that is spent on that process, that might be one way to think about it. But in terms of controlling for RT, I don't think there's a good answer. question for, for Brad about the task being normalizing for performance. Like I had a, a manuscript I submitted looking at a BART-like task I designed for fMRI where, where you'd watch gains rack up like a gas pump and um, I found that the drug abuse, like alcoholics had significantly reduced anterior cingulate activation in a conflict of earning risky reward like BART. Um, but they didn't differ in their amount of bus equivalents for that task. And I had it bounced by biological psychiatry. I had it bounced by AJP, because the reviewers like, well, why should we care if those if those alcoholics weren't being any more risk taking? And I finally had to put it in drug and alcohol dependence with some sort of unsatisfying explanation that, well, you know, this is heightened vigilance in a, in a laboratory task, but this decrement could mean something significant in real world, more nebulous situations, maybe. But I mean. Is this something that we all need to be educated about as future peer reviewers or grant reviewers that when push comes to shove, you have to normalize for performance first and make other inferences later? I mean, how, do you, how would you address this? Well, I think that the, the interesting information is not limited to the, the performance matched part of the data. It's the non-performance match is also interesting. The, the key is to be able to disambiguate those two things to, to understand to, to what extent your effects are driven by performance per se versus uh, group differences in the processing. So I, think, so I think the general answer is yes, we, are, we should be very, concer very much concerned about these performance issues, but it doesn't mean that the only 
the only product of the work that's worth coming to light is when everything else is controlled for wonderfully and all you have left is the exquisitely performance matched. Uh, I, I'm a big believer in understanding all the elements of the data that come out from the, those analyses. So I, the, the, the plea is to, is to pay attention to the full richness of the data set and to understand all the elements that are in it. I think that uh, what you describe from a, a peer review process, I suspect that most of us have experienced that as our papers get pushed back to us with, with this very same kind of problems. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I know we have, uh, we've completely run out of time at this point, so I apologize. But l l try to um, get them later, because uh, I think that this is very, very important for the field. So thank you to our speakers. Uh, and now, um, to end our wonderful meeting, uh, we asked Ron Dahl, who has a great perspective on developmental cognitive neuroscience, to please wrap it all up for us and you know, have us leave with the inspiration that we've gained here. And then Brad and I will have some closing comments.